Griff Hamlin here from Blues Guitar Unleashed. Welcome and thanks for joining me today. Today's video admittedly might be a little bit longer because I've got quite a quite a lot of stuff to talk about, but this is a little solo, a little 12 bar solo that I put together specifically for beginning guitar players. And I'm actually, beginning may not be exactly what I mean. This is obviously, you know, you're playing single note lines, it's fairly straightforward. But there's a, uh, it's surprisingly challenging when you actually do all of the things that you're supposed to do to do this right. So if you're new to soloing, uh, you know, maybe you can play a couple of songs, you can play a little bit, but you're more of, I'll say, an advanced beginner. This is probably right up your alley. And there's a lot of great skills that will be handled in this. And some things that you probably don't see on the outside, particularly if you're a beginner, there are some things that I'm going to bring to your attention as we kind of walk through this, things that otherwise I'm pretty sure you wouldn't see on your own as, oh, that's an important thing I need to learn. It's in here, all right? So uh, you can probably tell that the bulk of it is based around, not the bulk of it, all of it, is based around the A, uh, the good old A minor uh, box one. So if you're not familiar with this pattern, it's the A minor pentatonic scale. I'm not going to get too carried away on this video because I have so many others that, that contain this, but it's uh, typically we play that, you know, starting at the fifth fret of the sixth string, five, eight, five, seven, five, seven, five, seven, five, eight, five, eight. Well, one of the things that comes up a lot and, and that I like to fix right off the bat uh, involves what I call playing in the basement, okay? And typically, solos tend to happen in the top four strings. And that's nothing against these lower two, two strings, and it's not that you'll never use them, but they're definitely not as common. And what I see a lot of students do, uh, particularly when they're brand new to soloing, and you know, with box one, a lot of times I tell people, ah, just, you know, just kind of play the box, just kind of noodle with it, get used to the sound. Well, what comes back a lot of the times is they'll kind of mill around, you know, down here in these lower uh, notes. And the problem is that in the grand scheme of things, it kind of gets lost. You know, as the band's playing, those lower notes don't really cut. They don't really get out above the band. So it's kind of cool to early on at this point, you know, start to get used to the idea that you want to tend to stay more towards the top. Okay. Now, the other thing is that a lot of students, again, always start down here and play it this way. And so getting used to starting up here you know, and playing only from the top and then not going all the way down and coming back is another thing. It's a different skill. So it's getting used to seeing the pattern from the top, not just from the bottom. Again, a lot of people tend to just practice from the bottom to the top and back instead of from the top to the bottom and back, which is another way that you're going to need to see that scale. Now, the other thing that's going to go on is you'll notice there's some, some dead air. I start and then there's some dead air, okay? And that dead air is important because that's what we call phrasing. All right, just like when you speak, you, you leave space. You, you say something and then you leave some space. You have to give your listener some time to sort of digest what you're talking about. So learning to leave some space within your soloing is huge for two reasons. Three reasons, maybe. First reason for sure is, again, it gives people a chance to sort of listen and take in what you've just said. Okay. Secondly, it gives you a chance to collect your thoughts. Okay. There's, there's some time going by. You can stop and think about what you're going to do next. All right. And kind of to go along with that is it just lets the solo breathe as a whole. Okay. It lets you and your listener have that chance to just sort of relax because it can be very stressful. You know, when you play your first few solos, it can be very, very, very stressful. So it's some time where you can have some dead ear. But as a beginner, particularly, and, and even for many uh, intermediate, even to advanced soloists, leaving a few beats of dead air seems like an eternity. 
And it's really hard to get used to just leaving a measure, three, four, five, six beats of just empty space. That's really hard to get used to because it does. It seems like an eternity, okay? So there's kind of a cool little thing that's going on in this particular solo. And, um, and it, and it, and it kind of goes with a, a blueprint that I came up with once upon a time. I have a course called the Blue Solo Construction Kit. And what I did is I went through gobs and gobs and gobs of solos. And I noticed that there are certain common places where these spaces get left. All right. So there's, it's common for a lick to sort of take up the first couple of bars and then for them to be a little bit of space. And then the next lick goes sort of the next two and a half bars and there's a little space. And so there's very specific places where classic blues solos tend to leave a little space. So that's exactly what I did. I used that blueprint for this solo so that as you play this, you'll get used to hearing the spaces at a time when they are commonly used by B.B. King and Albert King and Freddie King and Johnny Winter and all those guys that you listen to all the time. You'll probably hear, oh yeah, those guys tend to take a breath about that time too. Yes, they do. And I know that because I actually went through, you know, dozens, hundreds probably of solos and these are common places where these holes are left. So by learning this whole thing all the way through, you're going to sort of almost through osmosis, you kind of learn where those spaces go and how that phrasing goes. Also, you're going to have to keep track of the beat. Why? Because you're going to leave an empty space and you got to come back at the right time. So you're going to have to count. And you know, I'm a big counter. So let's go through the, the, just the, the three lines. Each line is, is, uh, is four measures. Let's just go through them real quick and I'll show you how they work. There's actually very little music to memorize because mostly you're just going up and down through the box. So to start off, we're here going from the C at the eighth fret of the first string. We're gonna go all the way down to that G at the fifth fret of the fourth string and back up and then back down two notes. Okay, but what's key is that we get this in time. So one, a uh, two, a uh, three, a uh, four, a uh, one, a uh, two, a uh, three, a uh, four, a uh, one, a uh, two, a uh, three. So you'll notice that I don't start my lick on beat one. That's a rule. That's something that I that I talk about a lot. So of course we don't start on beat one. We start on the uh one and uh two and uh three and uh four and uh one and uh two and uh three and uh four and uh one and uh two uh three. A uh, four, and now again, one and a. Uh. So this time I'm starting from the G at the fifth fret. So the first note, I'll say, of the two on the fourth string. And you'll see that again, we're gonna kind of walk through it all the way up. And we keep going, now we're on the, the notice the D chord has come along, but we're still just going through our pattern. And we're gonna end at the C. Okay, at the fifth fret of the third string. So all you have to remember is where you're gonna start, which is the G, that fifth fret on the fourth string, we'll play up through the top, and then we'll come back down as far as the lower note on the third string. And again, if we put it in time, one, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, uh, one, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, uh, now on this next one, you've got to wait two and a half beats. One, uh, two, uh, three, uh, and you can see we're going to start at the eighth fret again, starting on the high end and we're going to work all the way down and just come back up one note just to the A. Okay. So Hopefully you can see that you don't have to remember a bunch of notes. You just have to remember where you're going to start, play through the pattern until where you're going to end, and then come back as much as you're supposed to. So one, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, uh, one, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, uh, one, uh, two, uh, three. We're starting again on the low end. 
uh, four, uh, one, uh, two, uh. This time we're gonna turn around at the A. Okay, so I'm not going all the way to the C. And ending on the third string. Okay, so again, if I put that lick in time, one, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, uh, one, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, uh, one. And I'm going all the way up again. I'm gonna go all the way down, all the way back up, and then end at the seventh fret of the third string. And all I gotta do is put that in time. One, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, uh, one, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, uh, one, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, uh. So that's the, uh, that's the gist of it. It's, it's actually fairly simple, I hope you can see. We're just going through the scale pattern. That's an important thing because it gets a lot more challenging when you have to remember all kinds of licks and, and extra notes and stuff. I just want to get you used to counting, playing the pattern from, from the different directions, right? Paying attention to where you are on the beat. All of these other skills that are really, really important. Yeah, licks are cool and you can add those later, but if you don't have these particular skills, your licks probably aren't going to sound very good because they're not going to be at the right time. They're not going to be in the right place. They're not going to be used properly. So if I can get you kind of doing this sort of thing in the right way, it's going to serve you very well. So let me play through this whole thing and I'm just going to count it. I'm not going to play uh, with my little um, looper that I, that I played in, but let me just count it all the way through. I would love you to try this with me. Here we go. Three, four, uh, one, uh, two, uh, three, uh, 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 four, uh, one. Uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, uh, one, 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 uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, uh. Okay, now, of course, if you were so inclined, you could play that over some sort of jam track. Right? You could probably find a slow blues in a jam track. What would be better for you is to record yourself into a looper or whatever playing a blues in A. Which again, I probably got in another video. In fact, I'm sure I have it in another video. So I'm not going to show you how to do it. But play a blues in A for yourself. Okay? This way you're getting used to playing the rhythm as well. If you ever find yourself playing with just one other person, this is an excellent skill to have because you have to be able to play both the rhythm and then when it's your turn, take a lead. And when it's their turn, you hold down the rhythm. So you need to be able to hold down the rhythm. <laughs> so hopefully I'm making that point clear as I'm demonstrating the blues in A. Right? Good. Okay, so of course I've already done that. I've put it into my looper. I played it on the way in, but let me play it one more time for you. Hope you enjoyed the lesson. Hope you will practice this. This is good for you. It may not be super sexy. It may not be super flashy or exciting, but this is really good for you and I hope you'll do it. All right, here we go. Let's play it down. I will see you again real soon. Take care.